So in this video, I'm going to be taking a look at the photoelectric effect experiment. And we're going to look at it in the context of the development of the theory of light. So I'm going to start off the video talking about the sort of development of it, so the first origins of it, talking about like Newton and Hohen, and then moving on to look at Thomas Young, and then finally looking at Einstein and the photoelectric effect. Um, so there's been debate about light for a very long time because we couldn't investigate it very well because I see it's very difficult or we can see light actually investigating it's very tricky. So one of the first people to um, make a hypothesis about how things are working is um, as often it is in physics Isaac Newton and his hypothesis was that light was a particle and he went and gave it a name so he called it a corpuscle and um, essentially, what he, so he was saying is light's not like a continuous wave, it's just a series of particles. And he also then went on to say that he believed that light travels faster in a denser media. And the reason he made that hypothesis was to explain the refraction experiment. So if we have like a glass block here with a refractive index greater than 1, what you'd expect to see if you have light coming in is something like this, so it will bend towards the normal. And he explained this by saying what's happening is the light wave speeding up and that's what's causing it to bend. There's sort of like a gravitational attraction from the object which accelerates the wave so it's going faster. So that was his uh, hypothesis. Now around a similar sort of time there was another scientist, a Dutchman, I think, uh, by the name of Hergen, or as people very often mispronounce, Huygen, if you're American. But anyway, it's Hergen. And what he was saying was actually, no, I don't think that Newton's right. He believed that light was a wave. And he went on to then contrast Newton as well and say that he thinks actually light travels faster in less dense media, which we now know to be true from the experiments. So... If you're interested in, in how that works and how that can be used to mathematically explain um, like refraction and Snell's law, uh, I've got another video about that, so um, do go and have a look at that. That's very interesting. Um, but let's move on. Okay, so that's new in Hergen. So, at the time, people accepted what Newton said. And there are uh, several reasons for this. Mainly that Newton was a much had a much better reputation as a scientist than Hergen. So he had just done his work with a prism, so he'd shown that white light could be split up into the different colours of different wavelengths. So he was the top dog at the time, so what he said goes. So he, once he'd made his hypothesis, he said he was right, so people accepted it. And hopefully you can all agree that that's a, some shocking scientist just accepting that without actually challenging him. But there are numerous other examples of similar type things happening in the past. So you, another example you might be interested in is Aristotle and his statement about flies. Uh, you can see another instance of people being very silly and not challenging someone about their hypothesis. But I'll leave you to look at that. Anyway, so everyone currently at this point believes that light is a particle called corpuscle. So they believe in what Newton said. And this st it stays that way for a long time until Thomas Young comes along. And what he does is a double slit experiment in order to demonstrate the wave properties of light. So what uh, Thomas Young did is he got a candle. So there is a candle. And what he needed was two pieces of apparatus. So he needed a, uh, a single slit because he needed to ensure he had a coherent sources of light for his double slit. So let's draw in his double slit later on too. So there's his double slit. So what happens is the light goes through there, gets diffracted out, so it goes over both of these two slits here. And then if we put our screen... in here. What he saw on there, if we're using a blue laser, was an interference pattern like this. 
So he was getting evidence of constructive and destructive interference, which was showed essentially that it, light had wave-like properties. If you do this experiment with um, particle theory, what you'd expect to see is two lines on the screen corresponding to the two slits here. Um, but that's not what they saw. They saw the interference pattern and therefore they knew that light had wave-like properties. Now if you've done this experiment, uh, which a lot of you might have done, um, you will have done this just using a laser like this and going straight into a double slit and then had your screen on the far side like this. So you had no single slit before that. And the reason is because a laser is a highly monochromatic source of light and you can shine it on both of your slits here. Um, so the, putting those two things together, you don't actually need a single slit to turn it into a coherent source of light. Because it's monochromatic, it's also coherent, which is very handy and is much simpler than using a candle or a light bulb or something like that. Okay, so that is the uh, setup for Thomas Young's uh, experiment. So let's have a quick talk about the two different models there. Um, so it was using a double slit. And so, as I said before, if light was a particle, it should in theory have produced two fringes of light, essentially one for each of the slits on that you send the light through. However, that's not what you see. What you see is a fringe pattern indicating constructive and destructive interference, which indicates wave-like properties. And um, they, scientists had learned their lesson by this point, and they developed the scientific method as a community. So actually then some scientists went out and tested what Thomas Young had done, and they were able to replicate his results, so his um, findings were reproducible. And that led to his his theory that light had wave-like properties being accepted by the scientific community once they demonstrated that it works. And it's at this stage that the photoelectric effect experiment comes in. Because now everyone's like, haha, Newton's an idiot, uh, which is always good, uh, thinking that he's a bit of an idiot because he does a lot of silly things. So now everyone's kind of like, whoa, Newton's not so great, Thomas Young's awesome, nice. So now the photoelectric effect experiment comes along and then it completely messes with this all over again. So, um, some quick definitions first of all. Um, the, I'm going to talk about the intensity of like, a, a source of radiation or a source of light. And what I mean by that is the amount of energy that that radiation is delivering per second to a meter square. That's how we measure intensity. And I'm going to talk about the impact of changing intensity. I'm also going to talk about something called a threshold frequency. And that's actually um, defined as the minimum frequency to cause a photoelectric emission from the surface of a material. And it's important that you include the second part in here, the fact it's from the surface. So this effect was just noticed essentially from um, some scientists playing around. And what they noticed is that uh, when they were playing uh, generating radio waves, what they could do is if they shone like a high energy light source, so a violet or even an ultraviolet uh, source, onto various metals, they could cause electrons to be emitted. And it's important that they are metals because you need free electrons in your structure for this to happen. Um, so it was given the name of the photoelectric effect because essentially photo, because it's caused by photons, which were just sort of hypothesized as a result of this experiment, and electric, because it's electrons being emitted and electricity is like dependent on electrons. Um, so what they had, um, they essentially had a piece of metal, a little bit like this one, and what they did is they shone some radiation, like a blue light typically, and then what they saw is that electrons would could be emitted. Now this um, light coming in is usually called the incident radiation. So just like um, when you're doing refraction you'd have angle of incidence, it just means incoming. Um, so that's your incident radiation and this here is called a photo electron because it's been caused to be emitted by a photon. So it's interacted with a photon and gained enough energy to escape. Just a 
Um, quick note here, this process here is not ionization. This is electron is one of the delocalized or free electrons in the metal structure. This is why you need it to be a metal to do this, because you need free electrons. So this electron is already free of an atom, so you needed to give it some energy to escape, but it's not ionization. Okay, so they did they did this experiment, they shone light and they had a look at essentially what happened to the electrons that were being emitted. And they made several key observations which are going to be important later on. Okay, so they noticed that electrons were only emitted from the metal when the radiation was above a certain frequency. So they tried it with red light, which is lower frequency, and actually they got nothing being emitted at all. No matter how long they waited or how much they changed the intensity, nothing happened. Whereas when they changed it to a violet light, that's a higher frequency, so it's a higher energy, and they found that they always got an emission with that. And they also noticed that the emissions started um, instantaneously, so they didn't have to wait time for the electrons to be emitted, so they weren't sitting waiting for enough energy to escape. You shone the light on, they started escaping. And what they noticed was that the rate of photoelectric emission was actually directly proportional to the intensity of the incident radiation, and this is one of the important things um, that led to the idea of a photon. Um, so, your, so essentially the higher intensity your incident radiation was, so the more energy it was delivering per second, the more electrons were emitted. Uh, but they noticed that the intensity had no impact on the kinetic energy of the photoelectric emissions. It was only frequency that could change the kinetic energy. And if you want to know how they actually measure the kinetic energy of photoelectrons, you'll need to get on old friend Google and look up something called stopping potential. So this is their way of measuring what the kinetic energy of the emitted electrons are. So I'm not going to go into that now because that's actually in one of the optional modules in A2. It's in turning points. Um, but if you're interested and want to know how they do it, that's the thing to look up. So those are the four observations that were made from doing this experiment. And now I'm going to talk about the issues that created for the wave theory of light, which they currently had. Okay, so wave theory um, predicts something different. So when you're dealing with waves, if you increase the intensity, you should um, increase the rate of photoelectric emission, so that's fine, because that's what they saw. But it should also increase the kinetic energy of the electron, so it says, oh, well, if we're delivering more energy, the electron should have that higher energy, um, if it's a wave. And they also said that any frequency of light should be able to cause emission, because essentially the electron can just keep absorbing energy, when it gets enough, it should be able to escape. So it shouldn't matter what the frequency is, um, as long as we deliver energy, it's going to escape. Um, but that, again, was not seen in this experiment, which is why they needed a new theory to explain it. That's how science works. When you can't use the theory to explain your observations, you modify or come up with a new theory. Um, so Einstein comes along and he proposes his photon theory to explain the observations of the photoelectric effect. So before I get into this, a quick definition there's a property called the work function, which is essentially a, a measurement of the minimum energy required to emit a photoelectron, again, from the surface of the material. So it takes a certain amount of energy for an electron to escape and overcome like the bonds and stuff in the material. Um, so using that principle, Einstein suggests that if we use a particle model where the energy is carried in photons, if the photons don't have enough energy to give to the electrons, the electrons can't escape, which is why there's this threshold frequency, because that means the photons, if they're below the threshold frequency, don't have enough energy to cause emission, and that's why the idea of photons comes in to help explain it, because it's just these packets of energy, and if they're not enough, nothing happens. But in order to conclude that that's what was happening, he also needed to assume that there was one-to-one -one interaction between photons and electrons. So he's saying that each photon could only interact with one electron and vice versa. So an electron can't take energy from two photons because then in theory, well, any type of um, frequency should be able to cause it to escape if an electron can take like five photons and then escape. 
There's only one-to-one -one interaction, and this is one of the uh, weird parts of quantum physics, the way you can get only this one-to-one -one interaction. So Einstein put these two things together and then suggested how we could explain the other observations. So he was saying that if we increase the intensity of the radiation, what you've done is you increased the number of photons that are arriving at the material per second, but not change the energy of those photons because you have to change the frequency for that. So what he said was, if you increase the rate of photons, you should have more electrons escaping per second. So that explains that observation. And that also linked into how intensity couldn't change kinetic energy because you're, by changing the intensity, you don't change the energy that each photon has. You just change the number of photons. Okay, so there's a mathematical way of putting these observations together, and it generates this equation here. So what it's saying is, um, this HF is your incident photon energy. This symbol here is the work function. This is the kinetic energy of the photo electron, and this is the work done to move the electron to the surface of the material. So like if we have a material of this sort of thickness here, so what the W is saying is if we've got an electron here, before we can emit the electron, we've got to move it to the surface, which takes some work, and then you have to give it the work function to allow it to escape from the material, and it will escape with kinetic energy by subtracting those from the photon energy. So this, the kinetic energy essentially is the difference between this and the sum of these two. Now, you're going to get a range of different um, kinetic energies of electrons emitted depending on where they were in the object. So we can calculate what the maximum possible kinetic energy is though. If we consider an electron that's already on the surface, so then we don't have to do this work to get it to the surface, so we can eliminate this term from our expression. So we get this expression here to calculate what the maximum possible kinetic energy is. And if we want to know what the threshold frequency is, that's the condition from where it goes from not being emitted to being emitted, and the transition one would be when your kinetic energy is zero. So that's on the point of escaping. So then you get this, the Planck's constant times the threshold frequency is equal to the work function. So they're directly connected together. Okay, so that concludes this um, section looking at the photoelectric effect and the different theories of light. And in the next video, I'm going to move on to look at some of the wave particle duality. So actually saying we're not going to consider light as just a wave or a particle, and we're going to look at um, some particles behaving like waves also.